Ah, good afternoon. How are you doing? Doing well, yes? Have you been enjoying yourself so far? Uh, I've really been enjoying this. My, my name is Scott Davis. I'm going to be talking about conversational UIs right now, talking about Siri and uh, Alexa and all the fun ways we can do this. But uh, after this talk, this is my last talk of the conference, and I get to do what you're doing right now, which is sit out in the audience and enjoy all these nice presentations. So I hope you enjoy yourself as we move along. As I mentioned, my name is Scott Davis. For a lot of years, I ran my own consultancy based out of a Denver, Colorado called Thirsty Head. Um, you'll still find me at thirstyhead.com and all my open source projects on GitHub under Thirsty Head. But uh, for the past year or so, I've been uh, working for ThoughtWorks and have really enjoyed my time there. But uh, I'm also an author. I've been writing about uh, web development now for, oh my goodness, almost 20 years. Um, my first book for O'Reilly was JBoss at Work. So I spent a decade or so dealing with open source Java-based web development. Uh, I did a number of things with uh, Google Maps and open source mapping. And for the last 10 years or so, I've been focusing on the, the mean stack, Mongo, Express, Angular, and Node.js, and more importantly, just HTML5 in general. So, to begin, you start thinking to yourself, well, wait a second, if we've been doing web development all these years, what does voice have to do with putting text and images, H1s and paragraphs on the screen? And what's interesting is that voice is truly beginning to take over the world. There are so many different ways that we're interacting with our computer devices. And we're going to talk about all the various ways you can do this. Alexa is certainly one of the most popular. One of the reasons why I enjoy dealing with Alexa so much is that she is based on open standards. Uh, W3C standards, the World Wide Web Consortium. So anytime I invest in doing Alexa development, I'm investing in standard tools and APIs that are going to give me a broader reach beyond my good friend from Amazon. So to give you an idea of how ubiquitous this idea of conversational UIs are getting, this is a device that for quite some time Amazon was giving away for free. And uh, I'm not a paid spokesman for, uh, for Amazon by any stretch, but just Think about this for a moment. Amazon was giving you this tiny little device, this tiny little device for free that allows you to either scan a barcode and order it automatically or say it as well. Milk, bread, peanut butter, things like that. And while that sounds like it might be a gimmick, in fact, what we're doing is we're beginning to embrace all the senses, all the ways you can interact. Because we've got this 101 keys and a mouse method of web interaction down pat. We've been doing that for quite literally decades. But how can we start bringing in the other senses? How can we make it as natural to speak your command as it is to type it in or pinch, tap, swipe as you would on a mobile device? It's interesting how pervasive talking to your computer is going to be. So much so, this is a ridiculous term. I have trademarked it. I have not trademarked it. No one else uses this but me. But when we're talking about IoT, the Internet of Things, it's helpful to realize that many of these things that we are plugging to the Internet are also conversational. We can now have thermostats on our wall that allow us to say, Hey, Alexa, I'm a little bit cold. And if you think about that, rather than walking up to a device and manually turning the device or pulling out your smartphone and touching and swiping, being able to speak your intentions really illustrates the point we're trying to make here. That this is not an or proposition. We're not saying you have to turn the knob or speak it. In fact, this is an and proposition. You can turn the knob and speak. And so in fact what we're doing are broadening our interactions with these devices in our lives. What we're doing is making our life richer by adding additional capabilities, not painting ourselves into corners or forcing our way into 
narrower and narrower communication paths. Gartner says that by next year, about 30% of our interactions are going to be conversational. And I can speak to this. I have a Roku device at home. Roku is much like an Apple TV or a Chromecast or a Fire TV. It's a way for you to get uh, all your Netflix and your Hulus and your Amazons and things like that. I've had all four generations of the Roku. In the first three generations, they have a remote that looks much like this. And when you want to search, you click on the magnifying glass and you laboriously type out what you're looking for one letter at a time. If I'm looking for Game of Thrones, I have to scroll over to the G and press enter. And then scroll over to the A and press enter. And scroll over to the M, you get the idea. This is about how long it takes in real time. Um, so not a very efficient way to deal with this. So when I had the Roku 4, I pulled it out of the box, I plugged it in, didn't read the instructions or anything, and it was actually a week or so later before I actually had to search for something. And this time I was sitting on my couch and I hit the search button. Instead of that familiar keyboard coming up, it says, talk into your remote. And I looked at my remote and I said, Game of Thrones? And in that amount of time, it pulled up Game of Thrones. I'm not pecking it out as we go along. I'm speaking it. Now, this brings up all kinds of additional issues. What if I'm already in a noisy room? What if it doesn't understand my accent? What if it doesn't understand the language I'm speaking? But if you can address all those things, it is a far more satisfying experience being able to say Game of Thrones than G, er, 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 A, er, 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 M, er, er, er. yeah? Yeah. So, the other thing that's interesting about these conversational UIs is when I say, hey Siri, where's the best sushi place in town? I am very specifically not typing in select asterisk from restaurants where type equals sushi and city equals Malmo. That sequel, of course, right? Do you, do you, have you heard this? That, that sequel was meant to be an end user query language. You're like, oh, this is wonderful. You have this database out. We'll just let all of our end users type raw SQL against that. How many of you have apps right now where that's your user interface? Just write some raw SQL. You'll be fine. Yeah? Okay. I don't either. I don't either. But that's effectively what we're doing here. But I don't have to say, hey, Siri, select asterisk from restaurants. I say, hey, Siri. What's the sushi place in town? This is getting closer to the true essence of a conversational UI. And this is not a new idea. This is a movie that uh, uh, came out in 1983, if you can believe it. But it perfectly illustrates the point we're trying to make. So if you will uh, indulge me, let's watch just a wee bit of War Games. Let's listen to it as well. We're in. <laughs> it thinks I'm Falcon. Hello. How can it ask you that? It'll ask you whatever it's programmed to ask you. You want to hear it talk? Yeah. I'll ask it how it feels. I'm fine. How are you? You. Excellent. It's a long time. Can you explain the removal of your user account on June 23rd, 1973? They must have told it he died. People sometimes make mistakes. Yes, they do. How can I talk? It's not a real voice. Uh, this box just interprets signals from the computer and turns them into sound. Shall we play a game? Oh. <laughs> oh. Don't you just want to watch the rest of that? Let's just cancel the rest of the talk and we'll watch war games, yeah? Uh, if we put that to a vote, I know how it would come out. So I'm very specifically not putting it to a vote. But what I wanted to illustrate is that this happened in 1983 from 
Matthew Broderick's clearly very, very younger brother, right? There's no way that's the same actor right now. But the technology there wasn't science fiction. That technology was available in 1993, excuse me, 1983, and it's available to us now as well. That was text to speech synthesis. And so let me turn around now and show you a more modern version of that same technology. This is from Apple. If you go to apple.com slash accessibility, we get a very modern take on that same technology. People think that having a disability is a barrier. But that's not the way I see it. You can catch up with friends. Ready? You can capture a moment with your family. One face, small face, focus lock. And you can start the day bright and early. You can take a trip to somewhere new. Three miles to the summit. You can concentrate on every word of a story. A bird began to sing. Jack opened his eyes. You can take the long way home. a film like this one. When technology is designed for everyone, it lets anyone do what they love, including me. Isn't that lovely? And I play these two videos back to back because it's easy to think that a conversational UI is kind of a gimmick, something out of sci-fi movies. Uh, I've got to tell you the way I use uh, Alexa is incredibly gimmicky. As I walk down every morning to my kitchen, I say, hey, Alexa, good morning. And she tells me a joke or some news blurb of the day. And then very quickly I say, hey, Alexa, play me some Bob Marley. And she plays me Bob Marley, and it's a wonderful relationship we have. But when we start considering the accessibility aspects of this, Alexa and Siri really in that point aren't uh, about addressing a particular disability. I can certainly type those queries. I know SQL. I could write those SQL queries myself. But what can be pigeonholed as a disability enablement feature, in fact, is just a feature. We don't call those accessibility features, we call those things universal design. Because these are things that you can use with or without a particular disability, it's just a feature. Now I have a couple more videos to show you, but I'm going to show you one more and then we'll get back into our regularly scheduled program. But this next video I want to show you is actually my daughter, Libby. Uh, my daughter is 11 years old, she has Down syndrome. And what's interesting is it affects her speech. Now, her receptive language is right where it needs to be. She understands everything that we're saying, but she can't turn around and speak her thought. She can't turn around and reciprocate. So this manifests in interesting ways. What I'm going to show you is a school report that she wrote, and she did write this herself. These are her words, but as the children in her class were meant to stand up and recite their reports, what Libby did instead was typed it in and had Siri speak on her behalf. So let's listen to Libby's school report for just a moment, and then we will get back to what we were talking about previously. My name is Jane Goodall. I was born in 1934 in England. I love animals, especially chimpanzees. I named the chimps, and one had a great chin. I named him Mr. Greybeard. Ah. 
I am a hero because I help protect chimpanzees. That's for that thing, girl. I am a hero because I help protect chimpanzees. I am still alive. Now I am an old lady protecting the chimpanzees I love. Apparently, uh, someone got that in front of Jane Goodall, and she reported back she was happy to hear she's still alive. So uh, we're, we're happy to report this. Um, but what this begins to illustrate is how this can be just a very natural part of your life. It just gets woven in. I told you I walk down to my kitchen every morning, and I say, good morning, Alexa, play me some Bob Marley. Libby wasn't able to do that, and it was frustrating. She had to tug on my arm to get Alexa to play Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band or the Lori Berkner Band or whatever Libby wanted to listen to. It was frustrating for her, and it was frustrating for me. And so using the same technology she used to give her school report, now she goes into the kitchen and types into her iPad, Hey, Alexa, play me some Beatles. And as Libby drags down with two fingers, she has Siri talk to Alexa, and Alexa in turn plays her the Beatles or the Lori Berkner band or whatever she requested. This is a very natural way to begin having these devices talk to each other, not as a programmer using APIs, but as an 11-year-old girl typing in to a device and swiping down with her fingers. So what we just demonstrated here is this idea of speech synthesis, text-to-speech. We also have speech recognition, which is speech-to-text. Both are interesting. One is incredibly easy and one is not. And I'm sure you can guess which is which. But for us to turn around and begin exploring these kinds of concepts, I encourage you to go out to MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network, and, the, and their GitHub repo. They have a number of executable examples that you can play around with. This is source code that you can download and run in your own browser. Now, speech synthesis, thankfully, has widespread support. So this is something, if it's been around since 1983, you would expect to see this kind of browser support. So in fact, what this means is in two lines of code, creating a new speech synthesis utterance, and then asking it to speak that utterance, yields this. Oh, no. Yields this. Hello, world. There we go. Hello, world. Hello, world. I could do that all day as well, yeah? Now, what I want you to notice is that I didn't have to import any code. I didn't have to NPM install anything, Bower install anything, Yarn install anything. These two lines of code are available to you in all modern browsers. Simply new up a new speech synthesis utterance and then speak it. This is a pretty easy solution. It's a pretty easy solution. Now, we can turn around and begin playing around with all kinds of things. So we can start with our original Hello World. Hello World. But then we can turn around and we can begin changing the voice. Hello World. Hello World. Hello World. Hello World. Yeah? And of course, these are going to vary from browser to browser, but the idea is you do have the ability to turn around and change the voice who's speaking. Hello, world. I can make that speech faster. Hello, world. But since Italian isn't my native language, I might decide to slow it down. Hello, world. Okay, that's too slow, but you get the idea, right? that we have the ability to fine-tune all these things. And again, none of this is a framework that you need to download. These are just absolutely native browser capabilities. Now, I've been showing you the simple version, just newing up an utterance and letting it go, but you can imagine there's all kinds of nuance we want to bring. Sometimes you want acronyms to be pronounced as a word, like RAM. Sometimes you want the letters to be spelled out like CPU. It would be odd to call it a kapoo, right? And then counting the amount of RAM you have in your system. So anytime you need to start adding some more nuance, what we can do is we can start using SSML or the speech synthesis markup language. Again, this is a W3C spec, and look how old it is. This has been around for quite some time. But what this means now is I can start creating my own 
SSML. Now, we're used to HTML, hypertext markup language. This should look similar to that, but you'll notice it is a different markup language. This is a markup language that's not visual in nature. This is a markup language that's oral in nature. And so when we turn around and say we want to speak something, we have a familiar paragraph like you would in HTML, but you have something new. S. S in HTML is strike through, but S in SSML is a sentence. Because there's a natural pause as you get done with every sentence. You don't run your sentences together. It would be hard to understand what the sentences mean if I never stopped to take a breath. So by providing semantics, a sentence markup, it allows me to naturally pause at the end of every sentence so we can capture the meaning. Now, we can see all kinds of good things coming in. We can turn around and adjust the voice. We can have female and male voices. So we can begin simulating dialogues. We can adjust the pitch and the rate. They can do things like uh, um, even slow down and pause. So if we were trying to say, hey, you have an incoming email message, the message's subject is, slight pause, ski trip information. So with SSML, we have the full capability to slow speech down, speed it up, the way it's pronounced, add voices, all kinds of things. But while text-to-speech is interesting, oh, speech recognition, that's where everyone gets really excited. Everyone gets really excited about this because this is a whole new way of interacting with things. Now, let's go back to 1987. This will be the last video I show you of the day. But in this case, we're going to look at a promotional video that Apple put out, not about accessibility, but about this idea of conversational UIs back in the late 90s. Excuse me, the late 80s. Graduate research team in Guatemala, just checking in. Robert Jordan, a second semester junior, requesting a second extension on his term paper. And your mother reminding you about your father's surprise birthday party next Sunday. Today you have a faculty lunch at 12 o'clock. You need to take Kathy to the airport by 2. You have a lecture at 4.15 on deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Right. Let me see the lecture notes from last semester. No, that's not enough. I need to review more recent literature. Pull up all the new articles I haven't read yet. Journal articles only? Mm hmm fine. Your friend... We can stop there, because I think you get the idea. First of all, Siri has gone through some changes, hasn't she, since 1987. Um, there was obviously, this was a concept video, not actual technology. Uh, one of the things we've discovered since 1987 is we're very comfortable with these agents that we can't see. I feel very comfortable walking into my kitchen and saying, hello, Alexa, good morning, without actually being able to see her. I don't need Clippy down in the corner saying, hey, it sounds like you're trying to listen to some reggae, right? Um, we're very comfortable talking to disembodied voices, which is interesting. But again, this focus on the conversational nature. Notice that he was able to say things like, show me all the papers I haven't read yet. Uh, journal entries as well? Yeah, of course. This is very conversational in tone, and we're adding context to it. And we could actually start adding sentiment analysis to it as well to start detecting things like sarcasm. So if I was able to say, show me every article ever written on HTML, I would hope my conversational UI would come back and say, really? Are you kidding? You know, can you help me narrow that down? I don't need to say select asterisk from the internet. That's certainly not going to get me what I'm looking for. So context, sentiment analysis, even the way you parse 
the spoken word is significantly harder than how you parse the written word. The reason why text to speech is so easy is that we can pull up a sentence, split on the spaces, and we get words. Yeah? And then it's very easy to look up that word in a dictionary and get a well formed pronunciation out of it. So going from text to speech is easy. Going from speech to text means where do I figure out where the word boundaries are? I'm not speaking like this, am I? And so now we need to have a lot more intelligence to say where are these words in this continuous stream of noise coming out of his mouth? And so Siri really is remarkable. Not that she can just show you where the sushi restaurants are in proximity to you, but the fact that she can understand the question at all. Siri was actually an acquisition. There was a company called Nuance that was actually spun out of the SRI or the Stanford Research Institute. This was one of the four organizations that was originally on the web. They kind of invented the web back in the late 60s. So it's only fitting that this research project has spun out. So anytime you're dealing with Siri, you're dealing with nuance. And anytime you're dealing with nuance, you're dealing with the cloud. We just don't have the horsepower at this point to do onboard speech recognition. I mean, it's impressive that this is a quad-core processor. It's impressive that this has more RAM than probably my first three computers combined, right? Um, but when I'm talking to Siri, I, have to, I always have to make sure that Siri doesn't wake up when I do that. Um, but whenever I'm talking to the woman who has a S in her name, um, uh, I have to recognize that that is round tripping to the cloud because all that sentiment analysis, all that sentence parsing, all that stuff is going on in the cloud. Now Google, has its own competing version of doing this kinds of things. Google has some really nice examples. Now these examples unfortunately only work in Google browsers, but it at least allows us to play around with this idea. And again, they have articles from 2013 describing this kind of stuff. Step by step, go and look at these code examples or you can just play around with them. So let's see what we can do here. If I click through, oh, you know what? I do not have a live internet connection right now, so I am not going to tempt fate as we go along. It's really unfortunate, but bear in mind as well that uh, we don't have the sea of green like we had for text to speech. This is certainly more rarefied at this point. It is really exciting when it works, but it is certainly not as widespread. But the same MDN examples that we used earlier for text-to-speech, they also have speech recognition available to them as well. And so if I were online, I would be able to click to change that color, wake up this app, and I would be able to say things like pink, red, green, and the background would change. So it's a bit of a parlor trick right now. It's not working because I didn't bother connecting to the internet before I started my presentation. Bad instructor, right? But uh, if you do uh, pull down this slide deck on your own and run it in your own browser, it is a lot of fun shouting colors at your browser and having it change dynamically. And so what we're defining in this is our own grammar now. And so we can see we're beginning using something called JSGF, which is the Java speech grammar format. And so what we're doing is we're saying these are the words we're going to pay attention to. Aqua, jour, beige, so on and so forth. And we're going to new up a new speech recognition, but we're going to pass it in that dialect, that grammar, those words that it should be paying attention to. And when it round trips to the server, it'll come back with not only the words that it thinks you said, but it'll also come back with a confidence level as well. So you can say, is this what you meant? Or this is, I think, what you meant with some degree of confidence. So the JSpeech grammar format, again, a W3C spec, again, close to 20 years old. This is well understood technology, well-supported. And this is what these grammars end up looking like. 
You have polite words like please and kindly and would you. You have uh, words like oh mighty computer and things like that. And you can start composing these grammars. So I can things, say things like please, please, please could you kindly oh mighty computer open the window. And I can declaratively define this syntax in a well-understood way that's supported not just in Alexa, not just in Siri, but in a wide variety of speech recognition situations. Now, I would love to live demo Alexa for you, but uh, Alexa doesn't travel nearly as well as I do. When I'm giving this presentation in India, Alexa wasn't quite there yet. Of course, two weeks later, I leave and Alexa comes to India. So this is something that you definitely need to be aware of, and you can play around with even if it is not available to you in your particular country. As a matter of fact, this is something you can play around with in a browser even if the Alexa service isn't available to you, you can do all of the testing and experimenting you need right in your browser. Um, there's also um, open source software. Uh, Amazon has open sourced Alexa, so you can run it on a Raspberry Pi if you would like. So you have lots of opportunities to play around with this tech without actually having to purchase authorized hardware and have that authorized service available in your country. But anytime we're talking to Alexa, what we're trying to do is teach her a new skill. And so once again, if we go out and look in GitHub, Amazon has provided a sample skill. Now this skill is kind of s silly. It's uh, called Space Geek. It allows you to say, hey Alexa, ask Space Geek to tell me a fact. Hey Alexa, ask Space Geek to tell me a fact about Jupiter. Hey Alexa, ask Space Geek to so on and so forth. And so rather than go through the code in great detail here, I want you to turn around and play with this on your own. But here is the step-by-step -step guide, and here are the high-level things you want to do. First of all, you need to discuss what your intents are. And these are named things like, hey, get a new fact intent, or a help intent, or a stop intent. You can see some of these intents are built into the framework, and some of them you create on your own. Remember the utterances we mentioned earlier? Well, now we have utterances down here where we have to say, hey, give me a space fact, or tell me a fact, or tell me a space fact, or give me a fact, or give me a space hint. These are all the utterances that you want people to be able to utter to your conversational UI. What's interesting is you can type in that utterance right there. You don't have to speak it, so you can short-circuit that aspect of it. Type it in, and then online, what you get for free is the format of the response and the results that come back. The response is going to be a getful post using JSON. It's a great opportunity for you to play around with Amazon Lambda or serverless functions. This is a great application for it because you can imagine Alexa sitting there not doing anything. Rather than having a web server up and running 24 seven, you could have Alexa wake up, hear your utterance and hand it off to a Lambda, which spins up in milliseconds, answers the query and then goes to sleep again. But the payload that comes out of that Lambda or that HTTP post request is SSML, we've talked about this as well. This is simple speech. Markup language, so you get all the sophistication of SSML, of that open standard that's been around for decades in this really cool, new, trendy device called an Amazon Echo. So we've covered a lot of ground here. And more than anything else, I hope you've been inspired to begin playing around with this kind of stuff. Because it is so exciting to have technology that's been in your browser, and not just your browser, but your browser, and your browser, and your browser, all major browsers. It's been around for years, decades, just waiting for us to use our own Matthew Broderick skills to turn around and make our browser start talking to us. Would you like to play a game? Yes, please. So voice truly is the next big platform. I keep coming back to Alexa. She's my 
favorite. I'm not trying to say that Google Home doesn't have value. I'm not trying to say that Microsoft Cortana doesn't have value or Samsung's Bixby or any of these other user agents in your life. I'm trying to focus on the commonalities, not one particular implementation. But what I love about Alexa is that she's standards-based. All of these W3C standards are in play with her. So as I am programming Alexa, I'm also building skills that apply to all the other open source standards-based conversational agents as well. We can ask our thermostat now to turn down the temperature just as easily as we could send a text message to it, just as easily as we could switch and swipe on our smartphones or actually walk up and touch the device itself. These are not or solutions, these are and solutions. We're not trying to force you to decide to use speech or a more traditional UI. This is an and opportunity to build out your user interfaces. Your interfaces should delight all the senses, not just the fingers in your life. Gartner says that 30% of our interactions are going to be through these conversational UIs next year. So this is the perfect opportunity for us to begin playing around with these things. I'm a web developer, so it sounds ridiculous to say, well, why would you ever try to surf the web through an Amazon Echo, through Alexa. How does that even make sense searching the web when there's literally no screen? And it makes sense when you say, hey Alexa, Wikipedia Carrie Fisher. And Alexa begins reading back the Wikipedia article. And she'll start by just reading the summary and you can say, hey Alexa, tell me more. Or, hey, Alexa, move on. Or, hey, Alexa, that's enough. Or do things like that. We really are in the era right now where we can begin talking our way through the web just as easily as we're able to read our way through the web or swipe and pinch our way through the web. So this conversational UI isn't science fiction. It isn't next year. It's already been here. It's waiting for us to begin taking advantage of it. So realizing that text-to-speech is deeply easy, you can do that offline, in browser, two lines of code, every major browser supports it. Speech recognition, that's tougher. That's tougher, but it's coming along. It's coming along, and boy, when you put the two together, that is when you get something like Libby's school report. That is when you begin something that's just not an add-on or an alternate or anything like that. It truly is just the way you interact with your device. And that, my friends, is what conversational UIs are all about. Did you enjoy yourself? I did as well. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.